So it's really about keeping your options open. And I'm a firm believer, as you know, that nothing is permanent. So once you make that first jump from job one to job two, you realize how easy it is. And then you get a little bit less scared of, well, what if this doesn't work out? Well, it's okay if it doesn't work out because chances are there's going to be something else that will. So that kind of made me a little bit less scared. And, and now I'm willing to try really anything, um, you know, for short, long periods of time. And I think that sense of fearlessness is really comforting. Yeah, I mean, it's scary. Change is scary. I'm in change management and people are laughing at me all the time now now that I'm pregnant and they're like oh it's the biggest change of your life and yeah <laughs> and just because I'm helping other people through change doesn't mean that I necessarily sure. go through it well myself but yeah. change is, is naturally scary hi everyone welcome to episode four part two of the power of why podcast if you missed the first part you better go watch it because layout is amazing and you do an <laughs> intro so <laughs> Um, so in this piece, we'll be t discussing uh, building relationships mm -hmm. and, and mentorship specifically. So if you can discuss why mentorship is important to you. Yeah, mentorship is really important to me, actually. When I first started my career, I actually had three mentors in my first year. And people think that's weird and crazy, and I don't believe that there's a maximum amount of mentors you can have in your life. Yeah. Uh, and that's because they each have a different purpose. So for me, a mentor is somebody that you engage in your life for a reason. Um, it's not this open-ended friendship that you're just going for coffee and lunch and hanging out and chatting about whatever mm -hmm. it's really intended you know I want to learn more about x so I'm going to find a mentor in that area yeah. and then when I feel like I've succeeded and achieved that goal then that mentorship relationship can end and that friendship can continue as an example mm -hmm. so in my first uh, my first year of work I had three and one was to a to learn more about consulting because I was navigating that lifestyle yeah Two was to learn more about change management because I had just heard about it and I wanted to, to find a way into that area of, uh, of the business. You and heard about it at work. Mm -hmm. okay. So I didn't really know much about change management before. And when I started in consulting, I didn't do change management. I tried a bunch of different types of projects. And then I tried change management and it felt like the clouds parted <laughs> and the sun came in because it was... It really feels like the area of work that I'm supposed to do, yeah. and that probably is really connected to why I wanted to be a teacher, right? It's all about connecting with people and helping people through change and through different areas of their life. And, yeah. and when I was struggling with becoming a teacher or becoming a consultant, and now I'm digressing, but when I was struggling with that, I had a mentor at school at the time that said, you can be a teacher without being a teacher. You yeah. can teach without teaching in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I found change management, I thought, this is, this is where I belong. This is what I want to do. Um, and so, yeah, so I had three mentors. One was about change management, one was about consulting, and the other one was about progression. How do I get promoted? How, what did you do to get promoted? How do I get there? What's the application process? And there was all of these very hoop jumpy type things to do at that organization at the time. So, mm -hmm. so they helped me with that. And so I literally had three mentors in probably a year and a half all at the same time. Um, so I think it's really important and I try to find reasons to have mentors going forward and then in, in retrospect I try to be a mentor as much as I yeah. can, whoever wants one. <laughs> I am mean, pitching myself now, no, just, yeah. uh, because it's important. I think it's important to give back and, yeah. and provide advice wherever people are looking for some. I'm also at the same time not somebody who gives advice unasked for right. because uh, I think that's very personal if you're if you're looking for help in your career find somebody that fits your lifestyle and fits your goals and hopefully uh, hopefully they'll say yes <laughs> what about peer mentorship because I'm assuming when you first started off these people had maybe 20 plus years of experience um, in their industry so do you have do you have peer mentors as well who are in the yeah same? I would say no that's not necessarily true one of them was probably maybe six months into the into the consulting okay. industry than I was. So it was more about um, understanding the lay of the land, having somebody that you're comfortable with asking kind of stupid questions to. Sure. So I called them a mentor. Um, they might not have considered themselves a mentor, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I did I did say like, you're my, you are my mentor in this area. So I, you know, I'd love to pick your brain about these types of things, but right. it wasn't um, academic. It was very much about navigating the uh, the jungle in, mm -hmm. in consulting so uh, peer mentors are totally totally fantastic again it depends on those goals that you're trying to achieve right and for the people who are um, students right now yeah who are interested in learning more about you know different industries or mm -hmm. trying to figure out what they want to do 
Um, Because I think, like, for me, in second, third year, especially fourth year, Mm -hmm. um, I think in fourth year is when I asked you to be my mentor through a program. Um, What's the right way to approach someone? You know, how do you start that conversation? Yeah, so if somebody's never been a mentor before, they're not going to know how to help you. And you'll love the fact, if they say yes, you'll, you'll love the fact that they've said yes. Yeah. We all need to give them some guidance around. So, you know, I'm hoping we can, we can have this relationship for a minimum of eight months. I'm hoping we can meet monthly. These are the things that I'm trying to achieve, and this is where I'm looking for your support. Mm-hmm. Um, if you really just leave it to a let's grab coffee whenever we can relationship, then it's, it's not true mentorship, and you're not going to get the value out of it that, that you, you can. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, and so somebody who's never been a mentor before, they might, not think that, they might think that kind of rigor is maybe too much, but you'll come to a meeting, your first year, first interaction, you'll look really organized and they'll put a little bit of pressure off of them. Mm-hmm. Being asked to be a mentor is like, oh wow, this person really feels that I know what I'm doing, so I need to know what I'm doing. And if you put it in a perspective of this is my goal and I think you can help me, then they can yeah. say, yes I can, or maybe I can't, but I know someone else who can. Exactly. So it'll help give them a bit of perspective. Interesting. Okay. Let's delve into more on the networking. On sure, the networking yeah. Side, Love I think, networking. And they're very closely linked. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> how do you how do you like leave or make a great first impression? When you're at a networking event, when you're at an interview in these different contexts. All these different areas. Yeah. So I'll talk from the perspective of, of being the professional at these scenarios. Sure. So for me, um, when I'm at a business banquet or if I'm at a wine and cheese or conducting an interview, um, I'll leave the interview for the, up to the side for a moment, but when I'm at these kind of social, more social networking events, personally, and this is a complete personal perspective, is I'm there to be somebody to interact with as a professional. So um, take advantage of me, right? So it's one of those things where if I'm sitting down with somebody at a table at a business banquet and they say, and they start asking me about my personal life or you know, where did I grow up, and do you like soccer, and hey, there's a hockey game tonight. Oh, I'll more than happily participate in these conversations, but I would be more impressed if we talked about, um, well, what is it that you do, and oh, that's Mm -hmm. interesting, and tell me about your progression, and how can I learn more about, and and kind of really starting to poke and prod about the industry and the type of work that I do, because really that's why I'm there. I'm there as a professional to help students with whatever it is they want to talk about. And if you're looking to get into accounting and you find out that I'm not an accounting person, I would not be offended if you're like, it was wonderful to meet you. Uh, looks like, it looks like, looks like we can't really connect. I, but if, if I do want to learn more about change management, I might come talk to you and I'd be like, that's That sounds fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, good luck in accounting. That's not for me. So, you know, be honest about it and really try to come with some targeted questions and, and come with, a, again, a goal. Is your goal to meet somebody in change management because that's your area of interest? Or is your goal just to make a new friend? Um, and that will really drive um, how you come across in your networking as well. Right. Well, I mean, if you're not clear on what you want out of it, exactly. then you're sort of there aimless. And <laughs> Ex- I think it's better coming in with intention on Absolutely. ABC, this is what I want to learn, or you know, asking you to go for coffee and doing, yeah. that, doing that later. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then the LinkedIn thing, I'm just going to throw this out there. It's a huge pet peeve of mine. When I go to these networking events, I meet like sometimes 20, 30 students. Yeah. And then 50 people will add me to LinkedIn. And if you don't provide any sort of context yeah, of, how you met. of how you met, chances are I won't remember you. Um, and therefore, if I don't remember you, I won't add you to my LinkedIn because my LinkedIn is for people that I know. That's my own, that's my own philosophy. So I've had students in the past say, hey, it was wonderful chatting with you um, about you know this, this, and this. Um, it was really great. Maybe one day we can grab a coffee and talk some more. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. We did talk about that. Lovely. Yeah. Thanks for adding me. So... So for me, it's really important. I think LinkedIn is a fantastic networking tool if used properly, and it can't be just kind of an aloof situation that you're just adding people that you met for 30 seconds Mm -hmm. in a group conversation at a wine and cheese. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a comment that I'll hear quite a bit from professionals. Mm -hmm. Leaving a a personalized note, they're more, you know, more often than not going to accept you. Mm -hmm. And um, in that case, if someone leaves a note, hey, we discussed this, can, and if you go back to it months later, you yeah, have a, a record a record of yeah. how you met, and you're more likely to say yes. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm interested in doing that. Exactly. If somebody six months from now is like, I really want to learn more about 
uh, your experience at Sprott, then yeah. and and I noticed six months ago that we we connected, then I'll feel less, I'll feel more inclined to to reach out and talk to them. So you said you were going to talk about interviews. Yeah, in sure. Leaving an impression. Absolutely. So interviews are really interesting because you can be over prepared and you can be under prepared. So first impressions for me are being timely, and that sounds obvious. Not all of the time. Mm -hmm. I interview people who are late, and sometimes they have a wonderful excuse for being late. <laughs> Still an excuse, right? Mm -hmm. So timely for me is a really big one. This may come across in, in an interesting way, but if you're dressed professionally and for the workforce, if I, if I'm applying for a company like Shopify, I might not show up in a three-piece suit. Um, but if I'm applying to a place in the banking industry, I might wear a tie, right? So it's just kind of knowing the environment that you're going into and dressing right. according to that mm -hmm. uh, to that industry. Um, chances the the best approach is to always dress a little bit better than you think because you never want to be underdressed than your interviewer if your interviewer shows up in a full suit and you're in khakis you know that's always something to be cognizant of so always think a little bit about that because first impressions can't be redone um, and unfortunately yeah. sometimes whether we believe it or not they they, they tend to play into it um, and then for me what makes a fantastic interview is people that have done their research you know if if I've asked them about the company or even things like, you know, why do you want to work in this field? Yeah. Having a thought out answer that shows that you've put some research into it and talking about the progression you want to make or you, the values of the organization you want to work for, it really demonstrates that the fact that you've put in some work before the interview, which shows you'll probably put in quite a bit of work after the interview. Once you get the job. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's dial back in terms of, um, I want to discuss self-doubt and having, you know, reservations. When it comes to, to networking or building relationships, cultivating them, they can't, you can feel intimidated. Yes. Especially when you're starting, you're starting out, maybe it's, what value do I bring to the table with, you know, no experience? And you can sort of argue that you do have a lot of experience. You always have you experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you deal with self-doubt, reservations, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Great question. I think that everybody has self-doubt. It doesn't matter yeah. if you're 30 years in or five years in or one year in. I think we're constantly trying to uh, improve ourselves um, and we're always our biggest critic. Uh, that's, that's something that we struggle with, I think everybody. Um, and one of the things that I do to help with that, with that is to have a good support system. So whether it's a family member or a close colleague or a friend to say, this is the situation that I was just in. Yeah. Um, this is what I did to deal with it. And I'm, and I'm constantly replaying it in my mind because I don't think I did it well. Mm -hmm. um, so having just an open dialogue and they might not say much and you might just be able to talk about it loudly. Um, that might give you some perspective of, okay, you know what? I think I handled it okay. Or, you know what, next time if I am put in this situation, I might do these things differently. Right. Um, having somebody you can trust to just talk about things out loud um, and then putting it behind you and having an action plan on how you would do differently next time mm -hmm. is probably the best way to deal with it. Just to learn from those experiences and continue to grow is how, is how I've dealt with it. And, and I mean, I deal with it every, like everybody uh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think that requires a little bit more self-reflection to mm -hmm. figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like that podcast, or not the podcast, the uh, TED Talk about uh, fake it until you believe it. So I, yeah, Amy yeah, Cuddy. That's it, that's it. So she said, you know, if you don't think you're there, keep faking it. Not, don't fake it till you make it, but fake it till you truly believe that you're there. And then one day you'll wake up and say, you know what, I am an expert. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important. So it's sort of de developing the relationship with yourself and mm -hmm. learning to, to value that. How do you develop and cultivate relationships with other people? I'm asking about my husband or... <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, we're saying, let's say, professional yeah, yeah, related yeah. to networking. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That makes more sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, so for me... I find I find I get a lot of questions from from you know students about keeping up their networking contacts and what do you need yeah. to do? You've, I've met ten professionals at this banquet and I went out for coffee with all of them, and I want to make sure I keep them in my network. So in ten years from now, if there's an opportunity, they'll remember me. Um, and what I like to yeah. remind people is um, people are busy. You can't you you can't constantly keep up a network all of the time. Uh, it's pretty much impossible. Um, but r remember that people, if you leave a lasting impression and yeah. you've made that 
connection on LinkedIn with a personal message that has a history attached to it. Uh, in a year from now, if you want to talk to them about something relevant, chances are they're, they're going to say yes. Um, it's actually really funny, just today, uh, I was on my way to a meeting um, and I ran into an old colleague of mine for my first job from about three, four years ago. Wow. And uh, it was very brief. We were, I think, in the same turnstile or something. And she was like, oh my goodness, it was, it's, wow, I haven't seen you in so long. And she just sent me a message on LinkedIn to say, hey, it was lovely to see you, we should reconnect. And you know, that kind of thing. And it, you know, I wouldn't have been like, I don't remember you. It's been four years. It's yeah. not well, we worked together or mm -hmm. we worked in the same organization. So it doesn't take a lot of effort. And I think people um, feel that there's a lot of pressure to do that. I think making a good impression is the effort. And then when you need them, um, should they be the kind of person that's willing to help, they'll help you mm -hmm. down the road. Yeah, I think that speaking from experience, you may feel pr pressure to constantly reach out mm -hmm. or you know see how they're doing but you're right mm -hmm. people are very busy and trying to maintain that whatever maintain means um may not be the key mm -hmm. but the first impression thing definitely mm -hmm. and if somebody matters. if somebody wants to have coffee for me i generally assume that there's a reason yeah. and if you're just having coffee with me to keep the relationship alive yeah that almost feels like a waste of time. So if you do that once, twice, I might not even continue to go for coffee with you. Okay. Whereas if you if you ask me for coffee because you saw a job opportunity at the place I'm working at, or yeah. you're looking for a reference, or you're looking for advice, then that's a meaningful conversation, and I would likely participate in that again should you need more help. Okay. One of my last questions is, uh, before the big why question, <laughs> is in terms of networking, can you discuss a little bit more about how networking has played into, because you've had a wonderful career, like I really did, <laughs> um, how it sort of played into where you, uh, where you are right now, and yeah. to the hidden job market, and what that means. Yeah, that's a really good question. So there is a hidden job market, for sure, um, and what, what we mean by that is um, not every job you apply to, uh, not every job is something that you're going to look for. It's something that lands on your plate, uh, and you still apply to it, but it's not really an active thing. Um, I was just talking to a colleague of mine the other day who was applying to a job and uh, and they were getting a bit nervous about their interview and I reacted like, oh, I love interviews, it's great. And I realized that all the interviews I've had over the last few years, I've had a job. So when you have this job mm -hmm. already, yeah. your confidence is a bit different because they need you and you need them, but not as much as you did the first time when you're jobless, right? Mm -hmm. So. So it's something to keep in mind that when people are contacting you, headhunting you, LinkedIn, I get headhunted at least two, three times a week on LinkedIn about new contracts and in the change management field, um, it really it really is a, you know, a, if you're keeping your LinkedIn profile updated, it is a place where recruiters will go and look. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a job market out there if you're willing to participate, but it's also reassuring to know that A, if you don't need the job, you don't need to take it, and B, if you just want practice on interviews, you can do that as well. Sure. Um, the way I moved from job one to job two was through an old colleague from school. Um, they I reconnected with them, and 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 we found an opportunity, and I interviewed, and I thought, hey, let's not make, let's make the jump. And then from job two to th job three was a training activity that I took. Um, it was a three-day training experience and the whole time I was sitting with my now colleague and he sold me on this new lifestyle and I thought hey let's let's give it a try so mm -hmm. so it's really about keeping your options open and I'm a yeah. firm believer as you know that nothing is permanent so once you make that first jump from job one to job two you realize how easy it is and then you get a little bit less scared of well what if this doesn't work out well mm -hmm. it's okay if it doesn't work out because chances are there's gonna be something else that will. So that kind of made me a little bit less scared and, and now I'm willing to try really anything um, you know, for short, long periods of time. And I think that sense of fearlessness is really comforting. Yeah, I mean, it's scary. Change is scary. I'm in change management and people are laughing at me all the time. Now now that I'm pregnant, they're like, oh, it's the biggest change of your life. And, yeah. <laughs> and just because I'm helping other people through change doesn't mean that I necessarily sure. go through it well myself. But yeah. change is, is naturally scary. Um, but being okay with being scared is, is the good part. You know, I want to be scared sometimes. I don't like comfort. Being too comfortable is scary to me. So 
why not try something new? Why not mix it up? Why not experience something different? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank, <laughs> thanks for sharing your uh, stories, for sure. Um, so the last question is, what's your why? What gets you up in the morning? Um, what do you feel that you are, what's your purpose here? Yeah, so my loaded question, the power of why is probably why we're here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so what's my why? So for me, um, it's funny because at work about a year ago, um, we did this team building exercise and they asked me this question. And I realized that the reason um, that I love, um, you know, the, one of the things that get me up in the morning is helping people. And that sounds maybe a little bit cliche. Um, but one of the things that was brought to my attention was, hey, you like to keep really busy. Mm -hmm. um, you often say yes when people ask you for things. You know, Leanna, maybe you should take a bit of a step back or, you know, don't overburden yourself. And I realized late, like, you know, just maybe a couple of years ago that I do these things not from a career progression point of view, um, but because when somebody asks me for help, I can't help but say yes because I want to help you. And I get more from that, I think, than you do because if I'm helping you, that that makes me feel good, it gives me purpose, and it yeah. makes me strive. So so it's a bit of both. I'm doing things, sure, to progress my career, um, but I'm also doing them because I like to do them. So that that's uh, one of the reasons why I moved to the Crown Corporation was because I was sensing that there was a bit of um, something missing from my career, and that was the give back to the community. So I started volunteering with Special Olympics. Yeah which I very quickly <laughs> jo made Naomi join, or encouraged Naomi to join. Um, and now I'm the co-chair of that community council, which is fantastic. Yeah. It keeps me very busy in my spare <clears throat> time, but it provides me an opportunity to give back to the community and help um, a group of a vulnerable sector that needs help. Yeah. Um, so it really, as much as it can be a lot of work, it really makes me feel connected and it really makes me feel good about uh, you know it's not all about the corporate life and making money and there are people out there that just want to have fun and I can help them with that and their and their social interaction so you know all of these things that we do in life for me is it has to have some sort of meaning and changing jobs and now having the opportunity and the time to give back was really important so again it's all about that that helping I think is the key word there for me my power of why. What a beautiful answer. <laughs> That's the end of it. Thank you so much, Lana. Thanks for, for having me. This is super fun.